55 and they paid the carver 39 pounds six and eight pence this type of screen is very plentiful in Devon in South Somerset, but in the north of the county, they're much rarer. This is Bamble Bowling Green, but until 1920, it was the village pond fed by the natural spring on the side there. It's fed grist mills from Doomsday's time. In 1921, the grist mill felled and was sold. And at that time, Weston was growing, so the water was sold for Weston. In 1920s, it was sort of covered over in grass, but about 1933, the local bowling club started, and they came here and produced what you see today. The fire station is one of the uh, lodges of Bamo Abbey, and it was given to the village by Miss Fazakley. In 1887, Miss Fazakley gave the village a brand new horse-drawn Merriweather fire engine and supplied the helmets and the uniforms and the bits and pieces that go together to fight a fire. Not only did she do this, she also gave the village some instruments and uniforms for a band. The station was used as a volunteer station and then through to wartime and then through to the county brigade and it closed in 1980. These days we use it as a fire station museum and also a local history displays and we hold small functions here. For Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee in 1887, most towns and villages tried to do something to commemorate the event. Some built schools, some town halls, some had a new church clock. But here in Banwell we decided to have a new pump and we dug a well. There had been talk of having a pump before in the village but uh, the funds could never be raised. This pump is 76 foot deep and has nine foot six of water at the bottom. The pump cost 146 pounds, 12 and a penny, and the money was raised before the pump was opened. In 1847, Joseph Dyer Simpson, a solicitor from London, built Bamwell Castle on the site of a medieval farmhouse that his father had owned since 1837. The property before 1753 belonged to the Bishop of Bath and Wells. The castle was built as a home for him and his wife and is set in 25 acres. The current owners opened the castle for cream teas, evening meals and bed and breakfast and also have a brand new teddy bear museum. I hope you've enjoyed your tour around Bamwell and realise now that Bamwell is not just a traffic jam and I hope next time you might stop, have a look around for yourself. Our thanks to Roy. Well, if you'd like to show us around your home patch and can think of six... We've travelled to a place that can boast one of the youngest castles and some of the oldest bones in the country. Hello and welcome to Banwell. Yes, this is Banwell Castle, but don't be misled. This stern exterior wasn't built to keep out the enemy, though it was designed to please a Victorian owner who wanted the very latest fashion, Gothic drama. In fact, you could say he was just keeping up with the Joneses. And they've certainly fooled a few people since. We're at the other end of the time scale, and indeed at the other end of the village are Banwell's Caves, where a fantastic collection of ancient bones are still the subject of scientific study today. Well, that's just two of the gems in the programme we want to share with you. Stay with us for the next half hour as we explore Banwell and its history. We'll follow the fortunes of the village firefighters, find out why the bowling green was once home to ducks and drakes, and join in the fun of the annual summer carnival. Well, this is where those famous prehistoric bones were found, in caves just round the corner here. The whole area, the house and the garden, were developed as a sort of Victorian tourist attraction with a message. The idea was to demonstrate the literal truth of the Bible, in particular, the story about the flood. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's start at the beginning. John, hello. Hello. Tell me when these caves were first found. Well, this particular cave was found in September 1824, but um, <coughs> the, the original stalactite cave was found in 1757, 
by miners, and then uh, the entrance fell in, and it was forgotten about until Dr. Randolph, the vicar of Bamwell, decided that he would open it up and use it as a, a show cave. And the money was to be used for a school that they were trying to find in the village. Now, I knew that it was called the Bone Cave, yeah. But I must admit, I didn't yeah. expect to see quite so many yeah. bones. What a collection. It is a collection. Well, when they tried to make another entrance to the stalactite cave, which is behind the house, they discovered this one by accident. The land belonged to the Bishop of Bath and Wells, George Henry Law. And Bishop Law decided that the bones were the bones of the animals that didn't make it in Noah's flood. <laughs> they were the ones that didn't get into the ark. The school got very little money because he spent most of the money developing this. And then uh, when they found the caves, there was nothing on the hill at all. No house, no follies, nothing. The house uh, was built because they um, wanted a little summer house for his visitors. And then they built all the follies. Um, to remind people of a pagan world that had been destroyed in the flood, the great biblical flood. The caves were managed for the bishop by William Beard, who gave favoured visitors a souvenir bone to take home. These days they're open to the public four times a year and by special arrangement for groups. The bones, which date back 70,000 years, are used by scientists as a type standard. Most of the bones that you see are bison bones. A prehistoric bison, not, not the same as a modern one. It looked the same, but it had bigger horns. Um, there's vast numbers of those. Uh, there are lots of reindeer bones. And what the Natural History Museum get particularly excited about, there's the big brown bear. And it wasn't a cave bear. It was the same sort of bear that you would find today, except it was much bigger than the biggest grizzly bear in Canada. The caves and the bones are part of Banwell's ancient past, but visitors who hope Banwell Castle will prove equally historic are in for a surprise. In fact, the fortifications date back no further than Victorian times. It was the fashion in those days to uh, have a, a country residence for people who could afford it. London solicitor came down here um, and that was Joseph Dyer Simpson, uh, who inherited it from his father, actually. But then it was just land with a medieval farmhouse. Uh, it had been bought from the bishop uh, century, almost a century before, but nothing had been done with it until he decided to build the castle. And uh, it came up with battlements, fortifications, gatehouse, everything. Uh, and they lived here happily enough, I think. These days, the castle's open for cream teas and evening meals. You can even stay for bed and breakfast. Current owners Bill Parsons and his brother Oliver took over the property in stages. I bought a cottage that came on the market in the wall of the castle that hadn't been lived in since 1837, and I moved in there in 1978. Um, we did that up, and um, then the building here, which is the original building to the castle, uh, that came on the market, and we bought that in 1980 and um, we've restored that and doing that up now. Um, we've now run it as a restaurant. And then um, 13 years ago, I bought the main mansion house that had been built in 1847. And I've actually got quite a lot of photographs of the previous owners and things. This is a photograph of Amelia Simpson. Um, it was her husband that had the new mansion house built. Um, they actually moved from here down to the Abbey and had that rebuilt where he actually died. Um, one of the owners um, in the early part of the century were Mr. and Mrs. Hope, and this is a picture of them. They lived here from 1902 until 1911. And um, then we go on to Mr. Carver, who's lived in the castle the longest. He actually moved in from Churchill Court in 1917. Um, he was a solicitor in Lon uh, Bristol and in London, and um, he actually died in 1963, so he was here quite a long time. When he died, the uh, Wills family, the cigarette people, moved in and they did a lot of work. And the uh, owner just prior to myself was Charles Skilton, who was a publisher, and he published quite a lot of uh, well-known books, things like Billy Bunter and Fanny Hill and Perfume Garden. 
played Chatuslava. He made quite a lot of money on that. He did tell me he made £3,000 a week back in 1963 when it was uh, published, which is an awful lot of money then. In the past, the gates were kept locked and people were unwelcome. I think it's actually nice to share. If you've got something that's historic, it's actually nice to share it with other people. We enjoy people coming around. Did you know that when John Wesley came to Banwell to preach, he was chased out of the town by the vicar? For many years, non-conformists were forced to meet in private houses. But in the 1790s, Banwell's first Methodist chapel was built here in East Street, known by many local people as the Institute. It was used for many years for village functions and is now a private dwelling. Well, this is Banwell Tower, and during the war, it was used as a lookout post. Now, in September 1940, Banwell was bombed, and in fact, five people lost their lives. Well, let me introduce you to somebody who remembers that well. Percy, you were in the Home Guard at the time, weren't you? I was in the Home Guard, yes. Uh, I joined the LDV, which was the local defence volunteers then, in May 1940, and we had to go up on top of this tower to look out for German paratroopers. What happened the night Banwell was bombed? We were moved from the tower onto Banwell Hill, and we had to patrol Banwell Hill, and a plane came over and dropped the bombs on the village and uh, killed the five people at the time of the bombing there. We think of our big cities as being bombed during the war, but we forget that small places like Banwell, country places like Banwell, were bombed as well. Why, why do you think they came here? Well, I think what it was, they tried to bomb Lock and Camp in daylight one day, and they came over that night, the village was bombed. A big searchlight, which was at night, came on, lit up Banwell Church Tower, and they probably thought it was the water tower at Lock and Camp. That's the only reason that I think that the village was bombed. So what was it like in the, um, the LDV? You called it the local defence volunteers, but they used to call it the Look, Duck and Vanish uh, Brigade, I, didn't that is, they? That is right, Polly. Uh, we started off with uh, we're doing the harm, harm drill, like an uh, ordinary drill, with broom handles in the primary school before we had a concern that the rifles came. Now, your other great love is Cavey. Right. And you've got a part of the caves named after you, yeah, Percy. Yes, I have. Um, I have. That is the ruby chamber. Mm-hmm. And, and that is one of the galleries. Right. Which is another chamber from the ruby chamber. That one is going from the shaft into the ruby chamber. Which is the bit you discovered? From there, there are all, all this. All this? All, all this, yeah. Goodness. It's named after me, with the actual cave and root. And it's called? The Baker Extension. But unfortunately, unless you're a caver, you can see the, the tightness to get through. The general public can't see it. Do you still go caving now? Yeah. You don't? Yeah, so I still go down in Banwell Cave. I thought you'd have more sense at your age. Back in 1539, the church wardens of Banwell splashed out a whole tuppence on one of these. It's called a fire pike, and the ones they bought were probably a bit longer. They're wooden-handled metal spikes that were used to pull burning thatch off the roof of cottages. Well, Banwell obviously had a lot of thatch cottages, and these were very important. It is, in fact, the oldest remaining firefighting bit of equipment that this wonderful museum has. Roy, this building itself has a pretty good history and it all revolves around that lady over there. Tell me the story. Yeah, Miss Fazakley, um, she was living at the Abbey at the time and uh, she was a, a woman that was involved in fire brigades where she came from before. And this was one of her lodges and she decided that um, the old fire engine was wore out at the time so she'd give us a new one. And this is what she gave, which is a Merryweather fire engine at the time, horse drawn. And the crew of the time, well, that's the, the brewer and the doctor and very, various um, carpenters, joiners, painters, all volunteers from the village. Yeah, that's the big difference between then and now. They were just volunteers, people who had other jobs to yes, do. Yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. So there was no payment, usually. Uh, the only payment usually came is to the pumpers. 
you know, when they put these handles out, they got volunteers from the village and paid them probably a half a crown or something uh, to pump the engine. They were a bit like the, the boys on the, the, the bellows of the church organ. That was re really hard work. Seems, it is hard work, yes. This is a bit faded, but there is the fire appliance outside the abbey. Yes, that's on uh, December the 19th, 1887. Is, is that the one that she bought them? Or this is no, an earlier no, one? No, this is an earlier one. Right. Uh, this one was uh, bought from Bristol made by Manley in Redcliffe Hill about 1810. Right. And um, this was usually kept in the church, right. um, but uh, sometimes it was kept in other places in the village. Now, this old appliance used to travel a fair few miles in its yes, day. Yes, yes, yes. It'd be all hand-drawn, though, but they yeah. did sometimes put chains on them, on the front, on the hooks, right. and drag them, and, and they have dragged this to Weston. Uh, how, long it, away. how long it took, I don't know, but probably the fire is out when they got there. Roy, when we're talking about um, fire brigades, of course, in the old days, it was the insurance companies that used to run them, wasn't it? Yes, yes, there was, were no fire brigades at one time, and the insurance companies, I think, when they started, they were getting, uh, you know, costing them money, so they got their own crews together with their own fire right. engines. So you paid money to the insurance company who gave you one of these plaques to put on your building, that's yeah? Right, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. Th this is a West of England. Yeah, that's right, yeah, that was local, yes. But th so that the, when they, the fire call was out, you'd know that they were insured, because if you didn't have a plaque, then you weren't insured, so they come and fought the fire for you. Roy, can you still technically be called out? Because, I, I, you know, I know the National Fire Brigade took over eventually. Yeah. Well, we, we could be, I suppose, but I don't think we will be. I don't think they get that desperate for us. <laughs> Although we are fully equipped to, to do it. <laughs> well, it's reassuring to know, isn't it, Polly? <laughs> it certainly is. We've got to take a break now. But don't go away, because after the break, we'll be finding out about Banwell's Carnival. Yes, and Roy's going to be taking us down to a bowling green that used to be the village pond. We'll see you in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Welcome back to Banwell. Very British, isn't it? Looking across an immaculately clipped bowling green in the middle of a pretty village to the church tower beyond. You'd think that this had been like it forever, but if you'd come here a hundred years ago, the scene would have looked very different. No bowling green then, just a huge village pond. Well, the pond was fed by a spring that bubbled up from an underground river that came deep from within the Mendips, and it actually played a very important part in village life because it powered a mill, didn't it, Roy? Yes, yes, uh, and we have a model of the mill here, and, and the mill building actually behind you, where the mill used to be. But there, there were mills possibly from Doomsday's time all the way probably on the river, but we're concerned mainly with the one up here at the top. So what do the mills make? Uh, it's a corn mill, grist mill, and... Um, in the 18th century, there was also a paper mill here. Um, where they said it made Bank of England note paper, but I've never seen a <laughs> reference to that yet. <laughs> That's why there are so many wealthy people yeah. in Bamwell. Yeah. But we, we have got a paper with the uh, 1812 Bamwell Mill watermark on it, so we, we do know they made paper here. But um, about 1850, the paper mill stopped, and it became a brewery, that side. The flour mill still went on, and that didn't stop until 1921. But the brewery, that finished about 1906. But how did the pond disappear? Because it, it seems incredible. We've got pictures of it as it was. Now it's a bowling green. Where did it go to? Well, it's been piped. The water's been piped underground down through the river and across to Weston. And they use it there. Because I think it, it happened, Weston was growing at the time. This is around the turn of the century. And they needed more water. Um, the pond was cleaned out and filled in. It was just a, a, an open garden at the time about 1926, and uh, the bowling club started down at Wolverstow Road, and uh, they came here later. Roy, well, can you tell me a little bit about something called the Abbey, which is actually just the other side of the church? Well, we, we don't really know. There, there, there's a religious building been here from King Alfred's time, but we do know that it was the bishops, one of the bishops summer palaces um, during the 15th, 16th century, and we do know that Bishop Beckington lived there now and again, and Bishop Godwin later lived there quite a bit. It later became a um, farmhouse until Mr. Simpson from the castle came down there and sort of remodelled it in sort of that Victorian Gothic, and then of course Miss Fazakley of the fire station came there. So Banwell's doing quite well really, it's got a, an abbey, a castle, and the caves. We do very well. <laughs> Yeah, it actually, most people think of Bam was a traffic jam, you know, because most of them come through, you're either at 9 o'clock in the morning or before, and that passed by the evening, but there's a lot more to Bam. As soon as you go off the main street, um, you'll find it's quite a nice place to be, really.
Much of Banwell's history was recorded in the 18th century by a local lawyer called George Bennett. Born in 1771, he made it his business to research the village's past, making notes and sketching local places of interest, both in Banwell and surrounding villages. He helped John Rutter, who wrote a classic history, Delineations of Somerset, and was clearly an accomplished scholar. This watercolour of his wife illustrates an interest in more homely matters, and it's his diaries, written in an almanac, that paint a picture of everyday life in Banwell. June the 3rd, 1825. James Cox died this morning, respected and regretted by everybody except the Corporation of Bristol, who got a good estate by his death. June 30th, a horse belonging to Captain Giles of Winscombe ran away with a four-wheeled carriage down the roadway and through the village of Banwell until it came to White Cross Batch, where it overtook Jeremiah Prussell of Axbridge, who was very deaf and could not hear it coming. August 26th, went to the top of the camp to see the children of the schools who were assembled for the bishop's inspection. Here, booths were erected, bread and beef given to the poor, tea, cakes and fruit to the more respectable. Did you know that Thomas Godwin, who was Bishop of Bath and Wells in the 16th century, disliked Wells so much he preferred to live in Banwell? An enemy of his at court, who hoped to gain possession of the bishop's property, told Queen Elizabeth that Godwin had secretly married a widow without seeking royal permission. Elizabeth was furious, and Bishop Godwin had to use all his diplomatic skills to keep his beloved home in Banwell. Like many places in the West Country, Banwell has a twin, Potigny in Normandy. Mick, how did this town twinning come about? Who approached whom? Oh, they approached us. I think it came about in this way, although I wasn't involved. There was a head teacher in Weston who's friendly with the mayor of Potigny, and at that time Potigny were looking around for a suitable village to be twinned with, and she recommended their first port of call would be Banwell. It's a small world. What have you got in common? Oh, lots of things. We're roughly the same sort of size, a very ordinary, down-to-earth village with very mixed population um, and an interest in making friends with people from another country. Did somebody say they were a mining town? They, they, yes, they were a mining town. Obviously, that's different from Banwell. Yeah. Um, predominantly agricultural round there, but uh, in the 20s, there was discovered iron ore in the locality and they set up um, fairly near the surface mines for which in fact they had to import lots of Polish workers because they didn't have the skills in Potigny which is as I say mostly a farming village. Now I know you've had your civic gatherings and a lot of you have been across there the, the mayors have met each other and signed declarations of friendship but what's in it for ordinary people? Well our hope is that it's that's exactly what it's about it's about ordinary people it's not a, a civic having functions, having presents and celebrations and those kinds of things. It's actually about ordinary people getting to know people of a slightly different culture and making friends. So our hope is that individuals and organisations like the Scouts or the bowling club or the football club or the bell ringers will make friends of, with their equivalents over there and set up lasting relationships that are much more than just an official piece of paper that's signed. Now, there is quite a sort of poignant connection, isn't there, between at least one Banwell citizen and this French village. Absolutely. One of our senior citizens, Paul Cockrum, he was in the party that landed on the Mulberry Harbour at Aramanche on the D-Day landings um, and was one, obviously, one of the, the first of the, uh, amongst the British forces to be landing in Normandy for the liberation. This lovely garden plays its part in the annual festivities that make up Banwell's summer carnival. A whole series of events, including a chance to look at some of the most beautiful gardens in the village, the celebrations traditionally last at least a week. It started in 1963, it was just a fete at the castle, and since then it's just, just grown. And um, we have this year, in fact, eight days. Friday night this year, because we have our French um, twinning uh, town coming over, we're having a barn dance, and um, they're giving a national display. And then on Saturday, of course, is our carnival day. The carnival procession is quite something each year, isn't it? Yes, and, and that too has grown. Um, I think last year it took nearly an hour to get from the far end of East Street to the recreation field. And it's been a special year, being Millennium Year. I think you've had some sort of carnival event every month since last carnival. Yeah, we've had events every month um, from um, Banwell in Days of Yore, which was a very popular evening, and everybody was sort of looking at the slides, you know, remember her, and he's been dead 20 years and whatever, <laughs> which was great fun. 
uh, and the normal things, harvest supper, um, carols under the tower, um, and, and right on through the year, it's been, been wonderful. Well, competition time now, and your chance of winning a £15 book token. If that is, you can correctly identify this place. It's somewhere we visited already on our Look Back 2000 series. Send your answer along with your name and address to Look Back 2000 HTV, Bath Road, Bristol, BS4 3HG. And good luck. Answers by Friday, please. And congratulations to Adrian Ward of Easton in Bristol for recognising last week's mystery place as the new terminal at Bristol Airport. Well, that's all we've got time for in Banwell. Thanks to everybody who's helped us with the programme this week. We've had a great time. Now, we're looking ahead to Norton St Philip, Farley Hungerford and the Forest of Dean. So if you've got any old photos or any film that you think we'd be interested in seeing, then give our man Morris a ring in the office. Well, his number's on the screen now, along with our email address, and we do like to hear from you. Next week, we're off to Bath and seeing stars, ghosts, and looking at what's in and what's out in the wonderful world of fashion. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. This is Town & Country, Programme 6, Part 1, Final Mix, Stereo.